His was the only boat to arrive. I think maybe it was a cow. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> There's a thank you letter from Lyndon Johnson. There was even a monorail at one point to the east of us. Plus, everybody forgets about pirates. This is the coolest field trip I have ever been on. I don't know, but I've been told keep on dance for never get old. Hello and welcome to the Long Island History Project, the podcast that brings you stories and interviews with people passionate about Long Island history. You can hear them all at longislandhistoryproject.org. My name is Chris Kretz. I am your host. And our opening music is courtesy of the Homegrown String Band. You know, usually on the podcast, we focus on stories from Nassau and Suffolk counties, places that are probably no more than 100 miles at most from New York City. But every once in a while, we get off at the wrong exit and find ourselves on another Long Island on unfamiliar terrain surrounded by obscure landmarks and unexpected accents. But all Long Islands have their history, and today we're exploring another one, heading down south to North Carolina on the eastern edge of Catawba County. This is the story of the Long Island Mill and the Long Island Mill Village. It's also a story about the Catawba River and Lake Norman, and it's a story we're going to tell with the help of a number of local institutions using a number of voices from the past, But let's start by introducing you to our primary guides, today's two very special guests. My name is Chuck McShane. Uh, I'm a writer and real estate economic analyst here in uh, Charlotte, North Carolina, and I'm very interested in the local history here. So I've, I've really been diving into a lot of local history, including the history of Lake Norman. My name is Jennifer Marquardt, and I am the site manager at Murray's Mill in Catawba, North Carolina. And I am also the curator of collections for the Catawba County Museum of History. So I'll be weaving together interviews I did with Jennifer and Chuck. We'll hear from Chuck a little later, but let's stick with Jennifer and hear more about the development of the Long Island Mill. Where does um, Long Island Mill, does that fall under your area or is it sort of a, a side interest that you've discovered? Or Because I work at a historic grist mill where we do corn and wheat. I sort of have an interest in mills in general. And while Long Island was a textile mill, it was originally water powered. And I like things that are water powered because Murray's Mill is water powered. And then Long Island is no longer there. And so I'm fascinated by towns that have disappeared for one reason or another. Um, So Long Island actually covers a lot of my different interests. We did an exhibit I, and for that, I ended up doing a whole lot more research into Long Island. It was like, oh, wow, this really is interesting and sad. So just the, the fact that you there was an exhibit on it, would you say it's sort of a, a prominent piece of local history? Was it, Or was it sort of undiscovered or, or needed to be kind of brought back a little? Uh, it needed to be brought back, partly because the kids, the kids who grew up there in the 30s and 40s, who were now in their 70s, um, still remember it fondly and we wanted to get their memories and their photos and their stories before they're all gone because they were the last generation to live there and once they're gone you know nobody knows now jennifer mentions an exhibit and that's uh, our signal to bring in one person you haven't heard from yet and we won't hear from him on this episode but his is a guiding presence we're talking about professor of history Richard Eller from Catawba Valley Community College. He was the man behind an oral history project involving the Long Island Mill Village. I love the name. It was Spinning Yarns, the Long Island Cotton Mill Family. It was a collaboration between Catawba Valley Community College's Hands-On History Program, along with the Historical Association of Catawba County. And thanks to Richard and that project, we are bringing you some of those voices that he recorded. So we want to thank these narrators. You'll be hearing from many of them today, and just to get all the names of the people he spoke to, Gerald Robinson, Gerald Sigmund, Fletus Poston, Carol Gilliland, Una Mae Brown, Regis Barnhart, Jean Fisher, Gail Edith Sigmund, and Sylvia Cannon. It was a good place to live. It was a simple life. Nobody had anything, but everybody had the same amount, so it didn't make any difference. Long Island had a ball team. You didn't want to miss their games on Saturday. I remember on weekends when the lookout down would close the floodgates. You could almost 
walk across the Catawba River from one side to the other. Daddy would fish and Daddy would hunt. We would have chicken on Sunday, but during the week we had fish or squirrel or rabbit. <laughs> so how far back did your research take you? How far? When was the mill built? What was in that area? Uh, the mill was built in 1852 by Dr. Avery Powell and John Schuford. And at that point, it was just a little piece of property. It had maybe five mill houses, a company store, and then the mill itself. In 1854, it got a post office, uh, which put it on the map officially. Um, apparently, there was some sort of scandal with Dr. Uh, Powell and Mr. Schuford. And they ended up selling the property to the Turner Brothers, who actually owned another mill about a mile downstream, the Mambo Mill. And so the Turner Brothers, who are originally from Statesville, which is across the river and up a little bit, um, the Turner Brothers ended up owning all three of the mills that were in that section of the river. And they did cotton, bread, and they did plaid as far as the fabric goes. And it, it was on the... Um... The western shore of the river? Yes. The village and the mill itself is on the western side of the river. However, there is actually a long island. Um, there are three large, larger, and I use the word larger loosely, um, islands in the river. And so it was named for the longer island that's there, even though the village itself is on the bank, not on the island. W was it a profitable mill, or did it take a while to get going? Or um, I It seems to be. We don't have a ton of the early stories because the people we interviewed were, you know, started out in the 30s and 40s. Um, I mean, there is a fair amount of interesting history from the earlier times. I know there was a murder. I don't know if you want to get into that or is any, any of the any high points of the or interesting points of the 1800 history of the mill that you'd want to say? Well, actually, the murder is the most exciting thing that ever happened <laughs> okay. in Long Island, if you want to call it exciting. Um so Thomas Covington worked for, well, let's go back. The Turner Brothers sold the mill to James Brown from Merchantsville, New Jersey in 1888. And then in 1894 is when the murder happened. Uh, Thomas Covington and Elam Josie were workers in the mill. And Josie had made a copy of the key to the general store. And so he and Covington were break, well, they weren't breaking into the store because they had a key. Um, they were going into the store at night and they were stealing stuff. And Mr. Brown knew that somebody was taking stuff out of his store. He didn't quite know how they were getting in there. And so finally he decides that he is going to hide in the store at night to see who it is. So he's hiding behind the counter. Covington and Josie open their way into the store at which point Mr. Brown realizes who it is. And so he confronts the guys. Josie runs off. Apparently, according to his confession, Covington sort of panics. They get into a scuffle. The gun goes flying across the room, but Covington ends up with it and then, in a panic, just shoots Mr. Brown three times and leaves him. And then he locks up the store, goes and finds Josie and gives him the key back and then goes home and goes back to bed. And is he, is he pretty much caught right away? Is, is Does Josie turn on him or, or do they? Oh, Josie sings like a canary. <laughs> they, they caught Josie and man, he just let it all out. Now he got in trouble too for stealing, but as far as the actual murder goes, that was just Covington. And what, what's, what's the final fate of Covington? Does he go to jail or is it worse than that? Uh, it's worse than that. He is hung from the scaffolding at the county jail in downtown Newton. Um, and it is the last public hanging in Catawba County. And apparently it was the first public hanging we'd had in a long time. Like there was a, a major gap of years in there when nobody was hung for anything. And then they do this to Tom. And I learned from my research, 35 people, or excuse me, 35 spectators <laughs> or less is a private hanging 36 spectators or more is a public hanging. And there were more than 36 folks uh, who showed up for this. As, as it grew into a village, was it only, the residents were only the, the workers at the mill? It was basically a mill town? 
Yes, it was a mill town. I mean, there's nothing else around there other than the other mill town. So all of the folks who lived there worked in the mill. So it, as you get into the people with the living memory, maybe we'll, we'll jump forward to them. What, what, how do they describe it? What was in terms of the demographics? What did you learn about the people that were working there? Uh, both men and women worked in the mill. Um, by this point, the children did not work in the mill, but they did back in the late 1800s and early 1900s. Um, the, the kids that we interviewed remembered it with fondness. Mama worked on the first shift, so she would get up about 4.30, cook breakfast, make biscuits, leave it all in the kitchen warm for us to go to school. Then she would walk to the mill. And then Daddy would get us up for school, and we'd uh, the rice and sausage and ham and biscuits was all ready to eat. And then when he went to work in the afternoon, Mama would come home. So one of them was there all the time. Maybe they didn't make the best wages, but they probably paid about a quarter a room for their house, and that included the lights. They could walk to work, and... Uh, they didn't do anything but mow the yard. They kept up their homes for them. I know we had a five-room house, and our rent was a dollar a week. And everything was furnished, just like she said, water, lights. They kept up the houses. Both my parents worked in the mill, uh, and uh, they worked on the second shift in the mill. Mom and my daddy and my grandpa and uncle and... I worked there at one time myself after uh, high school. It was real cottony. <laughs> Cotton was in the air everywhere. And when mom would come home, she'd have to comb it out. There wasn't many rules and regulations. They could go up to the store, get them a Pepsi and a moon pie, and go back. Uh, very seldom did you ever hear anybody getting in any kind of trouble about their work. Because people would always cover for the, if something would happen on the machine over on his, his right, somebody on the left side would go over and help him. And they'd catch up. And then it was just a share and share a lot. And one of my friends, Vivian A., they told her one night they'd keep up her job if she'd run home and make them a coconut pie. So she went home and made a coconut pie and brought it back, and they kept up her job. And the women, if they had a lot of green beans, they'd pick them and take them to work on the second shift, and everybody would help them string the green beans. One of the things that I found doing the research, um, which made me mad on their behalf, is that in 1929, the mill was bought out by Superior Yarn Mills from Mount Holly, uh, North Carolina, which is closer to Charlotte, downriver. However, Superior Yarn Mills was owned by the company that would become Duke Power. And starting a little after 1900, Duke was working on buying up all the land along the river so that they could eventually build these different hydroelectric dams. And so all the way back to 1929, they had bought the village and the mill with the idea that they were eventually going to close it, tear it down, and flood it. So Duke Power is our signal to bring back in Chuck McShane to help us get to the bottom of Lake Norman. How, how would you describe Lake Norman to someone who is from out of town? Well, I mean, I'd say Lake Norman's the I believe the largest land ma uh, man-made lake in uh, in North Carolina, and it is a large reservoir. Of, in fact, it has uh, 520 miles of shoreline along it. And so, there's really it's really I would divide it into really three different sections. So you have the southern section of the lake, which is uh, about 20 miles from downtown Charlotte, which uh, Charlotte's been one of the fastest growing cities in the country over the last several decades. Uh, so that part of the, the lake is really more of a uh, become more of a suburb, really a high end suburb of Charlotte. Um, and then the western side of the lake is a little more rural, a little more industrial. And that was really the purpose of the lake. It was to create and produce power. And that's where you have the nuclear plant, the wire nuclear station, the hydroelectric plant and a, a coal fired plant, which is, uh, I believe, coming offline now as, as they move to more renewable energy. And then the area where like Long Island, uh, North Carolina is, is uh, really on the northern tip of the lake. And it is uh, 
much more of a rural area, almost into the foothills of the Appalachian Mountains there. So it's it's probably the most sort of rural uh, country area of the lake. We should also mention um, you've written a book on the subject, A History of Lake Norman Fish Camps to Ferraris. Yes, it's through the uh, the History Press out of out of Charleston. Um, they produce a lot of local local histories. But yeah, that, that came out in 2014 and, and sort of walks you through the, the history of the creation of the lake, which wasn't created until 19... 19- 59, actually, but also the backstory of the area around there, going all the way back to to the time of the Catawba Indians, who were um, the Catawba Native American tribe who was in the in the area uh, to begin with. How, how did the idea of the dam come about? And was it a fight to get it done? Or was there anyone to really stop them from doing it? Or how was it perceived as they were building it? So it was part of a larger chain of dams and larger chain of hydroelectric projects throughout the, the Catawba. It was actually the, the largest one and the last one that was created by uh, Duke Power uh, and James B. Duke. Uh, interesting history there. He, he was uh, CEO of the American Tobacco Company, quartered 90% of the market in, in American tobacco uh, by the 19, early, or late 1800s at a time when a lot of tobacco was in use. Uh, actually was so successful in that that uh, the U.S. government said, you know, broke up that monopoly. And so he needed to find other ways to spend his time and, and, and capital. And there's a new, new thing called electricity that, w- that was happening at the time. So he was very invested, particularly in this area. He was originally from the Durham, North Carolina area. So he knew this area fairly well. And there, were, there was a growing effort after the Civil War in the Southeast to bring the mills to, to where the cotton was. Uh, And so there's a lot of industrialization around textile mills. And a lot of that happened originally using water power. And there was a big push late 1800s, early 1900s to uh, to electrify those mills. And so that's where the idea of the the Southern Power Company, which he created with with a local uh, few local investors here named James Wiley as well in and around uh, the Charlotte area. They set up the first dam just south of, of Charlotte, and that Lake Wiley was created. And from there, it, it, it took off. It is sort of a side question, but on, on Long Island, uh, one of our earliest power utilities was was Lilco, which wound up not having, you know, is, is probably universally hated. So oh, yeah. <laughs> generally speaking, it was Duke Power viewed favorably. What was the reputation of Duke Power? Uh, it's, it's an interesting question because we haven't... You didn't really see in the in the 1920s a whole lot of pushback. You did see some uh, some more traditionalists um, who who ran their mills who were maybe a little little reluctant to electrify them early on. The, the Great Depression put a lot of the the plans on hold, and so when you get closer toward when Lake Norman uh, starts to get created, and and you start to see uh, some of the the demolition that needed to happen, some of the pe- people who needed to move to to create uh, the dam, then you start to see some conflicts with with some of the farmers there. Uh, who were very reluctant to to let go of their land, uh, not in any organized way, really. Uh, but there were a few sort of notable kind of stories there of people who were very very reluctant to get rid of their land. Some of them were holding on to it because they thought it was worth more, and some of them were uh, were just a little more um, more reluctant uh, because they wanted they wanted to keep farming. Uh, and so there was even a story I have in there where thirty years after the lake had been established, there was a the son of a, a farmer who, who had initially declined to sell his land and was still paying taxes for land that, was, that had already been flooded. So he was already paying, paying fire tax for, for land that was under, under a lake. And, and it's interesting. I, I've, if I concentrate, I can think of maybe one or two other examples. But at this point in American history, this probably repeated itself across the country. Right? I'm thinking like the Tennessee Valley and, and other places. So yeah. it, it seems like a lost history of these huge flood, man-made floods, really, that destroyed or covered over a lot of history. Yeah, and it's interesting because uh, I think probably Lake Norman was better covered than a lot of the earlier ones, just because you did have a larger city nearby and a newspaper and, and a media who was paying attention to it was a little more populated. And you had gotten to the point where I think you, you also had a little more, um, well, I, I think at the time it, it was also viewed, certainly in, in, in Charlotte and, and in the South, I think the the news reports from that time were, were very celebratory of any sort of progress. And so you never know how, how much opposition there might have been that just wasn't necessarily uh, publicized as much as, you know, isn't this progress that we're, that we're seeing here great? And, you know, by, when I initially stumbled on this story, in my mind, I pictured like the waters rising around empty streets and buildings. But can you talk a little bit what, what you alluded to it a little, um, the preparations that had to be done 
once they knew the the dam was coming, they didn't just leave everything standing and, and flood over it, right? They had to prepare. Yeah, they they did. And actually, it was quite a long time coming. Um, there were plans for this as, as early as the, the 1920s. So think about Duke's um, progress on this. He had started with first uh, Lake Wiley in 1904. And all through the teens and 20s, the, the company had been planning um, large secessions of new lakes. The Great Depression put a lot of that on hold, followed by World War II. So this was a longstanding uh, plan for Lake Norman. So there, there was, Duke had spent some time buying up some of that land over the course of several decades. And um, people had, had moved on. This was also a time of great industrialization. So some people were leaving farms anyway for, for jobs in, uh, in Charlotte or in Mills and, and, and other, other places. But you also had some of the mills that were existing there. And Duke actually had bought some of those mills, like, uh, like the Long Island Mill, that were still operational. Uh, Long Island was actually one of the few places that had not been cleared uh, or was cleared very late in the process of planning. But overall, there was a really a, a massive forest and farmland that had to be cleared during this time. There, were, there was also a, a lot of old church buildings, a lot of old farming communities, a lot of old cemeteries there and headstones that had to be uh, moved. And that was probably the most, I think, sensitive detail that had to be taken care of. The dam was completed in 1260, early 60s. How, how long did it take for the, the river to fill in to the size that it is now? Was it kind of a slow motion death for all these places? Yes, it was about. It took about eighteen months for for all that the, all the water to flow. So everything below seven hundred feet elevation filled up, roughly seven hundred feet of elevation. I know there's the more exact number there. They expected it to take about two years, and it took about eighteen months. And it was actually just to give you an idea of how how rural the area was at that time. It became a pastime for a lot of these people to to go out after after church on Sunday to watch to see how far the water had come up. You know, and they actually had set up bleachers. Uh, near the area where they're creating this this uh, uh, dam to have people be able to observe it, but it was a, it was a major undertaking. It took several thousand workers both to both to clear the land from 1959 to 1961. Um, so that was a two year process in itself, uh, as well as to build the, the dam itself, which created its own own railway loading system, uh, lots of concrete, several turbines, and uh, from there. The water filled up over the course of, of 18 months, and by mid 1963, it was uh, it was full. What, what did the children? How did they talk about the learning about or the process of dismantling the town, for lack of a better way to say? It? Once once they knew, you know, was it? A, uh, how, how did they talk about learning that their town was going to be basically flooded? Um, the kids and their parents their parents were the ones who were living there at the time. They were sad. A lot of them really didn't know what to do because that's what they had done their entire life. There was a lot of anxiety when it, when it was first announced, but among the whole village because, and you know, everyone was sad to see it closed because that's where all your friends were. Well, everybody was lost. Uh, most people, other than maybe go to town on a Saturday, most people never left the village or the area right around the village. Uh, they just didn't go anywhere. And it was a, a new world for them to go out and go to Newton or Stageville or Mortimer or somewhere and find a job, all different people. You know, there's nothing like where we lived. Oh, they were disappointed. I had a cousin that worked there and she laughed about this one woman crying the last day. And when she went to hunt work, she worked about four jobs before she found one that sued her. She said, if I'd known then what I know now, I'd have cried with that woman. What happened was the house you lived in, they would give it to you if you would move it. And a lot of the houses were the people that lived in them, they moved them, uh, they bought land around in the community here and moved the houses. And uh, you can probably recognize a lot of the houses as you uh, ride around uh, in the community here that were uh, moved out of the mill village. Now, I, I don't know if you've gone to the actual or how, how close can you get to the site? You know, is it the shoreline, is, is, can you actually get close to where the mill was or see anything under the water or? Um, you can't see anything under the water because it's it's closer to the shoreline. Um, they had to tear down the mill 
the mill dams and anything that was going to be underwater because it would cause trouble for boaters and rescue operations and, and that kind of stuff. Like they didn't want the debris down there to snag stuff. However, part of it is actually still out of the water. The foundations from the old cotton warehouse are right at the edge of the lake. So depending on how high or how low the water is, you can see that concrete foundation. Where the old baseball field was, there's a road now, but like that area is still there. But the buildings are all gone. You still have the, well, there's still some trees and stuff around there, but but it's not much. So it is a side question, but it, since um, I'm up on the I'm on the south shore of Long Island, we have actually a lot of a deep history of mills from the more from the 1700s, 1800s. Um, when when you hear Long Island, New York, does any do you have any mental model or picture or what do you think of, if anything at all, about my Long Island? I have never actually been to visit your Long Island. Um, you know, I think of I don't know sunny beaches and holiday getaways. And I mean, I know there was a lot more to it before that. I know you all had a major hurricane in what, 38? Yep. That's very good. Yep. When when I think Long Island, I think of sort of the, um, Long Island, New York, I think of kind of the the high end, the high end suburb of New York city. A lot of uh, people commuting in, um, who may work on wall street or, uh, or elsewhere. So I think that that's, that's an interesting parallel there with Lake Norman and that Lake Norman's kind of emerged as this this high-end suburb. I know there's a lot more to Long Island, New York itself, but that mental model for me is sort of big suburban houses and uh, commuting on the on the train into into Wall Street. As as you were talking to these descendants or you know the people that remembered it, how how close are they still? Are they sort of dispersed across the country, or is it still a, a some of them still living near each other? Or what was your sense of what the community feels like now? Um, a fair number of them do still live in the Catawba County area and down towards where Long Island used to be, the ones who are still around. Um, I know I saw on the Facebook group that there are people in Texas and other places, but you know they still have ties to Long Island. It seems that they still keep in touch. When Richard Eller did the interviews, he got a good crowd of people that came back to do it, um, and they were excited. And every... It seems like every year, but it may be more it may be more than once a year. The local library does a Long Island History Day or you know a couple of different events where folks come and they share photos and they share stories about just life in the village. And that's been a huge popular event for them. How would you say the level of interest is in, in the area for that local history? Are, are people aware of it, interested in it or? I think it's interesting because it's an area where a lot of people say no one's from here uh, because it's grown so quickly, particularly the, this area around Lake Norman. It, it's kind of funny. You're probably more likely to, to meet someone from Long Island, New York than from Long Island, North Carolina around Lake Norman today just because so many people have moved down with the banks or, or, or so many people are new to the area. So I found the, the interest in it strong. And I mean, the book came out eight years ago and I'm still I'm still getting questions about it. So. <laughs> Uh, I think I think there is a lot of a lot of interest in it because uh, people like to spend their time there as well. It's a recreational hotspot. You know, you go out there on any time in, in, in May or, or September and there are you know, countless boats on the lake. And it's actually it's been interesting because people don't even realize it's a man-made lake because if you move here. You see that oh, it's a really nice lake. And then you start talking about it. And it's like, oh, it's actually man-made. Oh, it's really then the uh, questions flow. And then there's a lot. I think I think people like to know where they what came before and um, yep. especially in a place where there's a lot of, there's a lot of newness to the place. So it doesn't seem like it would have a history, but it really does. And thanks again to Jennifer and Chuck and Richard and all of the narrators talking about their past in the Long Island Mill Village. It's been an honor adding you to our roll call of Long Islands throughout the United States and across the world, we're still looking. So again, periodically, we'll be taking these turns and finding people passionate about their own Long Island. So hope you enjoyed this one. We will have links in our show notes to many of the resources of the Catawba area. That's at longislandhistoryproject.org. Also ways to find Chuck's book and to find Jennifer's Murray's Mill Historic District 
If you're ever heading down south, make sure you check in on them. And if you have your own story to tell about our Long Island, geographically located just off of Manhattan, between the Atlantic Ocean and the Long Island Sound, why don't you get in touch? Drop us a line at longislandhistoryproject at gmail.com. Maybe you've done some research yourself, or you've got a family story to tell. No matter what the decade or the century, we would love to hear from you. Our outro music is Capering by the Blue Dot Sessions, used under an Attribution 4.0 international license. That does it for another episode. We're going to leave you with one last voice from the Long Island Mill Village. And as always, thank you for listening. I remember waking up on a Sunday morning, the mill was shut down. It was real quiet, and the quietness would almost deafen you.